Please open in your Bibles to the fifth chapter of James. As we draw to soon a close uh, next Sunday, we finish the book of James and our authentic Christianity series going through this book. It's been a real blessing. But we're looking at verses 1 through 6 of chapter 5, and I want you to follow along as I read them. And as you open there, you're opening to the first book that was written in the New Testament. Uh, before the apostles wrote the Gospels, before uh, Paul began writing his epistles, the first church at Jerusalem, the first pastor of that church, the Lord's own brother James, ministered as a pastor in writing this letter, the earliest of the New Testament books. And he, of course, is the first one to address the dangers that that fledgling church, numbering in the thousands, was going to face. And he does that by telling them what an authentic Christian looks like. As I read verses 1 through 6, and you just listen and uh, follow along in your Bibles, we're looking at, listen this carefully, how to avoid rusting our souls by having a corroded life. You say, what does that mean? Well, that's what James is talking about. Now, here in Tulsa, you might not think of it, but I grew up in the North Country, and if you didn't wash the salt out, and if you didn't protect uh, the inside of your uh, car, those hollow spaces where water seeps in, if that salty, uh, ice-protected salt from the roads got in and you didn't do anything about it, pretty soon your whole car corroded. My car, you still see the ground when you're sitting in it. And when we went over mud puddles, they splashed in because it was corroded. It used to be the trunk. You couldn't put anything in the trunk. It was all, you could see the gas tank when you looked down. There was just nothing. It was all eaten up. It's just an amazing thing to have a corroded car. It's a deadly thing to have a corroded soul. Listen to what James says, starting in verse 1. Now listen, I'm reading the New International Version. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted. Moths have eaten your clothes. Verse 3, your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Verse 5, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. Verse 6, you have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. Well, now that we read it, you can all go, it's not us. Oh, good. I mean, right? It must be them or it must be somebody else and we're not rich, right? So it's not us. Oh, good. So we can just listen to this, but it doesn't have anything to do with us, right? Wrong. That's right. I want you to think visually this morning. We're going to use the balcony as an example, okay? If our world of six-plus billion people was reduced down to fit into this auditorium, and if we could have nicely 180 seats up in the balcony, and these would be the good seats, they'd be air-conditioned, they'd have, like when I went to Ranger Stadium and went to a baseball game this summer, they would have those people bringing food to you constantly. The whole time during the game, we had a a white-shirted, black-tied person bringing us food the whole game. I mean, just finished the peanuts, and they brought more. Finished the hot dog, they brought another one. I mean, this guy that took me, had, I said, how much did these seats cost? He says, don't ask. I mean, so that's what the balcony would be like. Air-conditioned and flowing food, nobody crowded, thick, cushy chairs, okay, for 180 people. The other 820 would be down here. They wouldn't have any fuse. They wouldn't have any air conditioning. And most of them wouldn't have any food. That's the division of our world right now. One billion people in the Western world, the civilized world, the business world, that have everything. The other 820 representing the 4.9 billion people that are less privileged. Let me read to you about what they're like. In our little setting here, the community in the balcony would be on the high hill called the developed world. The rest live in the rocky bottom land called the rest of the world. 5.4, between 4.9 and 5.4 billion people down here, 
and just over a billion up there. We, the fortunate 180, and by the way, if you haven't noticed, America is, is 99% up here on the hill. The fortunate 180 on the hill would control and hold in their hands 80% of the wealth of the whole town. We, on the hill, would own half of all the homes in town. That means that 20% of the people own half of the homes. We, in our homes, would average two rooms per person, where in the underdeveloped world, they have five people per room, if they even have a home. Our possessions would include 85% of all the automobiles, so 20% of the people have 85 out of every 100 cars, 80% of all the TV sets, and we would do well to just dump those down here and let them have them all, you know. We don't need them up there. 93% of the telephones, and listen, we in the balcony would make an average income of 20000 per person per year. Now, if you have a very large family, that might not mix out, but if you're in a normal family of two, you might make more than that. And that's the balcony. The not-so-fortunate 820 people down in the bottom where no pews are, they would be getting by on $700 per person per year. Most Americans spend more than that on coffee at convenience stores. They would be getting by on, on some of them. Now, t those are the wealthier ones, 700. Some of the very, very poor in Bangladesh and Central Africa would get by on less than $75 a year. I mean, that's, that's what we lose out of our pockets. You know, I mean, that doesn't even count to us. The IRS says, man, you can put 200 bucks a year for change in the offering plate. I won't even count. You know, the IRS says you can claim that every year if you want, because that's nothing. They average five people to a room if they even have rooms to live in. But how do those of us in the hill dwellers up here in the balcony, how do we use our incredible wealth? Well, as a group, and I'm not talking about our church, I'm talking about America, we spent less than 1% of our income in aid to the people in the lowlands. But let me share with you what we did spend our income on, okay? In 1997, and you can get the almanac from Barnes and Nobles and look this up, it's fascinating to read. In 1997, Americans, out of every $100 that we earned, we spent over $26 on our homes. So between a quarter and a third of our income goes into our homes and the gardens and the lawns and the, you know, all that stuff that, that we have. $18.30 out of every 100 bucks goes into food. Amazing how much we spend on food. $17 into health care, $12 on our transportation, $7.60 is spent on recreation and amusement. America spends 8% of our gross national product on amusement. Those people don't even know what amusement is down there in the bottom world. They're in survival. They don't know about amusement. They don't know about recreation. They're trying to live. We spend $6.80 out of every 100 on clothes. That means almost 7% of our income is in clothing. And then... We give, and, and this is not uh, evangelical, born-again, fervent Christians. This is just across the board. $2.30 out of every hundred, 2.3% of America's income is given for religious and charitable uses. But so little of that goes outside of our country. It's just used to charitably take care of ourselves. And all the 5.4 billion people are out there, many with no home, many with no food, the vast majority with no hope of eternal life. I wonder how the villagers on the crowded plain of the, those people who are suffering, one-third of all the 5.4 billion are having some form of malnutrition. I wonder how those people down where there are no pews feel about those up in the balcony. That gives you a little perspective when we go abroad, what they think of us. They see our movies. They see the rich driving our cars, they watch us on TV, and they wonder why we have so much and they have so little. Well, we're the rich this morning that James is talking to, maybe not guilty of the evil they're guilty of, but perhaps guilty of not being aware of how wealthy we are. Once. Uh, a great plantation owner invited the revivalist John Wesley to his home in the British Isles. On the way to the home, this wealthy plantation owner took John Wesley on a horse and said, let's take the long way to the house. And they rode all day long and had only seen a small part of all the plantation the man owned. 
At the end of the day, as they rode in to his mansion for supper, the plantation owner proudly said, Well, Mr. Wesley, what do you think? To which John Wesley replied after a moment of silence, I think you're going to have a hard time leaving all this. You know, this morning, the plantation owner is an example of those who are attached to the world they're in. Wesley was attached to the world he was going to. It's hard to leave this place if you're attached to it. It's not hard to leave it if you're headed somewhere else. You know, on Monday I, I stood, at, or, or Tuesday morning, uh, one of those, I don't remember, but I was standing next to, to Willard Heck, maybe it was Thursday morning, I can't remember, it, but Pastor Heck, I was at his hospital bed, and he couldn't even open his eyes. He just had tears running down his face. Uh, they hadn't done the, the, taken the food off his lungs yet, and he was really having trouble breathing. You know what he said to me over and over again? He said, I'm ready to go home. That's where I want to be. I want Jesus to come and take me home. Do you know why he says that? Not because he doesn't love us. He, not because he doesn't love his wife and his children and his grandchildren and his church family. He's saying that because his heart is more over there than it is here. Because he has sent so much of his life to the other side, to eternity. What good will our treasures on earth do when we leave them behind? One pastor in Minneapolis helps us envision the final irony of holding on to stuff. And he, what he did is he did a biographical sketch of the KAL-007 flight. Remember that Korean Airlines flight that the Soviets shot down when it went over their military base? Killed all 269 people? Listen to this. In that instant when that air-to-air -air missile hit that plane and blew it up and it, it extinguished the lives, 269 people entered eternity as their plane fell into the Sea of Japan. Before the crash, they, they went on the airplane as a noted politician. There was a millionaire corporate executive. There was a playboy and his playmate. There was even a missionary kid on the way back from visiting his grandparents going back to serve the Lord. After the crash, they stood before God, utterly stripped of their MasterCard, no longer possessing their checkbooks, their credit lines, their image clothes, all their How to Succeed books. They didn't even have their Hilton reservations. Here the politician, the executive, the playboy, and the missionary kids all stand on level ground. They have nothing, absolutely nothing in their hands. They possess only what they took in their hearts and what they sent ahead. How absurd and tragic the lover of money will seem on that day, like a man who spent his whole life collecting train tickets, and in the end, he is so weighed down by his collection, he misses the last train. So what good? James asks in this passage. Does the collecting and hoarding of possessions do? And the answer is easy. No good. Well, let's read it again. And I want to read this second time. Look at, at James chapter 5. And I want to read a paraphrase this time that makes it even more gripping. Okay? Uh, this is what those that, that paraphrase the scripture trying to highlight things say. And this is from Taylor's uh, Living Bible. Verse 1, look here, you rich men, now is the time to cry and groan with anguished grief because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Verse 2, your wealth is even now rotting away and your fine clothes are becoming mere moth-eaten rags. Verse 3, the value of your gold and silver is dropping fast, yet it will stand as evidence against you and eat your flesh like fire. That is what you have stored up for yourselves to receive on that coming day of judgment. Verse 4, for listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated out of their pay. Their cries have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Verse 5, you have spent your years here on earth having fun, satisfying your every whim, and now your fat hearts are ready for the slaughter. Verse 6, you have condemned and killed good men who had no power to defend themselves against you. This is James's next hard-hitting point in his sermon in James chapter 5. He says, I want an authentic Christian to know that they must avoid the danger of wealth. He says this, hoarded riches will corrode spiritual living. He says also that money and what we do with it talks to God. God watches whether or not we pay our debts, whether we give fair wages to our employees. And if there's greed in our lives, greed screams to God. And finally, he says that luxury living is incredibly dangerous 
to spiritual life. It's worse than fat. It's worse than secondhand smoke. It's worse than radon in your basement. We don't have basements here. In New England, everybody had a radon detector because of radon. It's worse than carbon monoxide in an unventilated, heated place. Luxury living. Let's go through these verses and take them apart piece by piece. Number one, verse one. He says, come now, you rich, and weep and howl for the miseries that are coming on you. Point number one, all of our wealth will never buy happiness. All of it will never buy happiness. I like this. Tertullian, who was a Roman lawyer who got saved in the first century, going into the second century. He became a great apologist for the Lord. This is what he said. He was very wealthy. He was very successful. And as he became a Christian, he lost it because of the Roman Empire's persecution of Christians. And this is what Tertullian said. Nothing that is God's is obtainable by money. So I don't need it, he said. You can't obtain anything of God with money. Interesting. All of our wealth will never buy happiness. Look what verse 2 says. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Point number two. All of our possessions left on earth will someday rust and rot. It's like I met with a businessman last week, and I was sitting with him, and he's successful. And, and I mean successful in, in the millions of dollars in this business here in town. And I was sitting there at lunch with him and talking to him. And, and he's really con considering the claims of Christ in his life. And I told him this. I said, you know what? I said, you're in a boat. And your boat is sinking right now. And you've got, your boat is piled with stuff. And only what you pick up and throw out of the boat before it sinks is going to last. It's kind of totally against our thoughts. We think we've got to hold on to it and keep it in our boat. God says, throw it out into God's hands. And then it'll last. Remember what the Lord says? What you hold on to, you lose, and what you give away, you keep forever. And, and this man, he sat there, and I shared the scriptures with him and talked to him about that. And, you know, I really think that it's starting to percolate in his mind that what he keeps stored in that boat that's sinking, in other words, our life on earth and our time is running out, and it's soon going to be over, is going to be gone. But what we throw out and invest in the Lord it's going to last forever. That's what verse 2 says. All the possessions you leave behind will someday rust and rot. Verse 3, your gold and silver are corroded. Listen to this. All misuse of our wealth will be reported to God. We were at Gettysburg uh, this fall, and, and, uh, or last fall in October. And we were, I mean, it's amazing if you've never been there. It's a beautiful place, and it's so moving to see all what people paid for in that conflict uh, as they fought one another in our civil war. But, but we thought, what a great picture. So we got all, we went, we stopped the car, and there's one of those massive, corroded green copper cannons, you know, or brass, whatever they're made of, and there it was. And it had this beautiful backdrop. And so we lined the kids up in order of age on that cannon, you know, little, all the way up, and they were all holding each other and smiling like this. And so I backed up and backed up until I could get them all. And as I got down like this and I got the picture, I noticed at my feet it said, stay off the cannons. You know what? They were going to report my misuse of the cannons. The park service was coming because you're not supposed to get on the cannons. Well, that little sign, you have to be taking a picture to see it, you know? And I didn't see it. But you know what? They, they didn't stop. Everybody's on the cannons there. But the point is this. God says any misuse of the stewardship of your possessions I give to you is going to be reported to me. And look back at verse 3. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. What did we do wrong? The, the early Christians in the first century listening to James preach this said, what did we do wrong? This is what you did wrong, James said. You have heaped up treasures in the last days. He says, you were so concerned with having enough to make it to the end that you didn't have God's priorities with your stuff. Did you know they had that problem back then? We have it today. And God says all misuse of our treasures. Do you know what a misuse of treasures is? God, Jesus said in Matthew 6, a misuse of treasures is to stack them. That's what hoarding means, to stack. To, to have so much that you stack them. You know, I think about that. I, I, it's getting to be spring now. So I opened and I looked at my sweater. You know, I, I'm preaching this. I looked at my sweater. You know, I love to fold them so they all are on top of each other. And I thought, God 
doesn't like us to have our life be a sweater covered of stacked stuff. Now, it doesn't mean you have extra stuff. What it means is that when we heap together treasures and, and they're corroded because they're not invested for God's purposes, now, by the way, God's one that invented the idea that you are supposed to prepare for your latter days. You are supposed to be like the ant that stores up your food for the winter. God says, if you don't take care of your family, you're like a, like worse than an infidel. But there is a, a line that we have trouble finding between caring and lux- luxury living in the future. And that line, James chapter 5 says, is... If we misuse our wealth and use it only on ourselves, we'll be reported to God. Verse 4, all greed with our wealth cries out to the God of justice. Did you know that, that every time we, we Jew them down and Jew them down and Jew them down and, 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 and finally just pay the very least amount possible and then go below that, and it hurts the poor worker. I think about that. When our house was built, so many of the people who worked on our house didn't even speak English. And they were paid in cash by the contractor. And they probably went and spent it all where they shouldn't. But you know what? Those kind of people live all around us. I went down Lynn Lane all the way from uh, Admiral to 111th yesterday. And I looked at the people that, that live in some of those apartments. And many of them most likely are living on subsistence. And I thought about how easy it is to cut a contract that cuts the least it's possible to them because they don't have a union. They don't have a way to to fight. And what God is saying back then, these people were not paying the people harvesting their fields enough. And they they were not paying the wages to the laborers. And they were holding some back and saying, oh, you didn't finish that corner, you don't get anything. You did it all but that corner. And and by fraud, look at what it says in verse 4. You're keeping back some of the money by fraud. And he says, and when those people cry out and they're anguished because they have nothing, He said, those cries go right to the ears of God. Verse 5, and this is even harder. You have lived on the earth in pleasure. You know what his fifth point is? All of our indulgent or luxury living with our wealth offends God. Now we're back to the the, uh, town and country magazine I saw the other day, waiting for my haircut. That luxury, crusty lifestyle where, where you can't just have a watch. You have to have platinum got to have diamonds, got to have rubies and emeralds, you know, to, you, you can't just have a car, you got to have, remember Elvis Presley, crushed diamonds in the paint. You know what I mean? That's the luxury living of our world. And what he says is all of our indulgent, and indulgent is when, when you just, you're, you're living it up, and, and you're, just, you're just burning the money, they say, you know, you, you, you just indulgent luxury living offends God. Look at verse 5. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. Did Jesus live that way? Did Jesus live in pleasure and luxury? Did when God got to live the Christian life the way it should be lived, how did he live it? He lived it most associating with the common people and most showing he understood their plight. And it says the poor people received him gladly. How did Jesus live? Is a question. How did the Apostle Paul live? He says, I know how to be abounding. I know how to be abased. He says, I've learned to live in every way. But he says, you know what? I have given all to Christ. And he says, if, I, if I'm with someone that's wealthy, I can eat at their table. But he says, if I'm with someone that's poor, I can eat at their table. That's absolute biblical contentment. That's not indulgent luxury living, which offends God. Finally, verse 6. All neglect of sharing our wealth with the poor is an offense to God. Now, this is a very hard um, verse, the sixth verse. It says, you've condemned, you have murdered the just, and he doesn't resist you. I mean, when were the Christians in Jerusalem condemning and murdering people? Well, what I believe he's saying here, and, and, and of course, I, I wouldn't uh, you know, be dogmatic on this, but what I think he's saying is, by neglect, you have not reached out to those. Remember what the Lord says? Do you know who? most gladly receives the Lord, the poor. They don't have anything else to live for but God. And he says, by your neglect of ministering to the poor, you've condemned them to, to die. A lot of them, mal- back then, people, they were starving to death, like today in some parts of the world. And he says, if you don't minister to them, it's like you've murdered them because you have all this and you're not giving it and you're not ministering. Well, 
What do we do about this, James? How do, how do we live in such a way that we can please God? Let me just real quickly give you some verses, I think, that will really help. Jesus Christ gave a theology of money. And turn back to Matthew 25, and I'm going to run you through these real quickly. You might just want to jot the verses down. Because Jesus laid down some laws for how to live around wealth. And I love them. And all of us are, are living around wealth. Either we have it or someone we know has it or we're in a country of wealth. And, and Jesus says, I want to give you some principles to make decisions on. And so he actually gave laws. And, and uh, they used to call these the laws of wealth in, in the old days, uh, uh, the old Puritan preachers. But let me just read them to you, okay? The first one's Matthew 25, 18. It says this, But he who had received one, this is the parable of talents, one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Or, that's the New King James, uh, the NIV says, hid his master's money. Law number one, Jesus says, never forget your money already belongs to God. It's not ours. It's his. Notice the, the point of this parable is not where did he hide it, how did he dig it, how deep did he put it, uh, what building did he put it in, did he put it under a tree. The idea is it wasn't his to start with. It was his Lord's and Master's money. And Jesus said the first law of dealing with your wealth is to realize it's not yours anyway. It's the Lord's. That affects you. I remember when I had a company car when I worked for a big corporation. I, mean, I, I, I knew that my supervisor was going to check that car in. It wasn't mine. I wanted to be careful. Remember that. Jesus said, never forget your money already belongs to God. Look, look at Mark 12, next book to the right. Mark chapter 12, the second law of how to deal with wealth. The first one is, Jesus said, never forget your money already belongs to God. It's the Lord's money. But secondly, Jesus said, giving must be proportionate to gain my favor. Matthew, or Mark 12:43. he called his disciples and he said, Assuredly, I say to you, that poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. She must have been intimidated. They were bringing wheelbarrows of coins. And she only had two. And they were the smallest coins possible. But Jesus said her giving in proportion to her having was so great, she's the biggest giver of all. Remember, God rewards proportionate giving, not how much. That's why in the building, if you gave a dollar but you have two, you gave sacrificially. Few people gave half of all they have. But if you gave 100000 and have 100,000, that's wonderful, but that's not proportionate giving. And what the Lord said is here, I, I reward proportionate giving. That gains my favor. If you give something that is big, but it's not big in proportion to what you have, that's wonderful, but it's not gaining his favor. What he likes is something that costs us something. Costs us something. You know, the, the, a lot of, uh, uh, younger family people, the, the only discretionary income that they have is what they give extra on their mortgage trying to pay it off. And I think about, in, in a lot of people's lives, they say, how can I give? You know, it, it's giving something that costs them, not going out to eat, not uh, maybe going as nice a vacation, or maybe not paying off that mortgage as fast. That's what the Lord says, I count what hurts you, not what's easy to give. That's one of his laws. Now, look at Luke 6. Here's another one, and, and our culture has cultivated this extensively. Luke 6.35, another law. Jesus said, selfishness ruins all of your giving. Now look at Luke 6.35. Love your enemies and do good and lend. That was a form of giving. Listen to this. Hoping for nothing in return. Do you know what we've done nowadays? If you'll give $25 to our ministry, we'll give you a Bible. If you'll give $50 to our ministry, we'll give you a Bible with gold letters. You know, I mean, have you ever noticed that you get something for giving? And there's kind of a selfishness involved that if you give so much to this ministry, you become in the gold club and your name is in a plaque and you're in a memorial garden and you're, you're there's, there's a little bit of selfishness involved. What he says is, a law of giving is, selfishness ruins it. If you hope for anything in return, it doesn't count. That's why it's so wonderful. I remember when uh, MacArthur told me about how a couple brought a paper bag and put a note in it, and it was on the floor by his door when he came into work, when they were building the worship center. And the bag was absolutely, it was, all, it was a Ralph's bag, and it was all stapled shut. When he opened it, it was totally full of money, and the note said, we were going on 
our honeymoon and they named the exotic island and they said we decided that that would fade as soon as our suntans faded and what we thought is if we put it all in this bag cash what we were going to spend and just stayed you know at the La Quinta Inn in, in San Clemente for a couple of days that our honeymoon would last forever with God and they didn't sign their names you know I think that's gotten more mileage John's told that story so many times because you know what that was that was sacrifice with no selfishness involved the fourth one look at Luke 6 38 the same chapter three verses over Jesus has always remembered giving is compensated he says this in 38 give it will be given to you by God, not by the ministry, not by promotion, not by recognition, not by memorialization of, 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 of blowing the trumpets for being a superstar, but by God. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Have you ever noticed that when they give you your french fries, sometimes they just barely fill the thing, and other times that the person goes like this and they jam some more in, they get the scooper and they go like that? Those are the ones I like. I mean, they're filling that thing up because they're too expensive anyway, but they go like that. You know what God says? I, that's how I give all the time. He says, I'll push it down, I'll shake it, and I'll put some more in now. I'll even have it falling off so that you can eat somebody else's french fries that fall out in the bag because I'm generous, God says. Now listen, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I mean... God says, whatever scooper you pick to scoop into my life, I'll scoop back into yours with that scooper. This is not prosperity gospel. This is the Bible. God says, I will give like you give to me. Those people in James's time hadn't gotten that message. Luke 16, just one more after this. Luke 16 and one more. Verse 9. Jesus said, temporal money can be exchanged for eternal wealth. And I say unto you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. Take that, that godless, uh, worshipped idol money, unrighteous mammon, and when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. This is what the NIV it grabs a little better. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so when your worldly wealth is gone, you'll be welcomed into an eternal dwelling. I like that. Exchange... Uh, this money that, that can't be used other than right here and give it for eternal benefit. And finally, here's the last one, Acts 20, 35. And this is our closing thought. Jesus' final law about living around wealth, Acts 20, 35. I've, Paul's talking. He says, I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember, he says, this is the Apostle Paul, and he's quoting something that's not anywhere else in the Bible. It's a revelation. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Then he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now listen to this. Jesus said, I love and I bless givers. Now, how, how do we avoid rusting our souls? How do we avoid having a corroded life like an old beat-up jalopy from the north country that's, that's just falling apart? Well, Jesus said, you avoid eroding your soul if you never forget your whole life that everything you have right now already belongs to me I just want you to acknowledge that and remember you have to give proportionate to gain my favor it has to really cost you something and selfishness will always ruin giving if you expect something back and always remember that I will compensate you I'm going to scoop back in your life with the size scoop that you scoop in to my kingdom in fact God says I'll fill your scooper fuller than it's ever been filled before. And he says, you can exchange the temporal for eternal. And I love and bless givers. Remember this morning how we are apart from God's favor. Stripped of God's spirit, we're nothing but dust. Stripped of God's purposes, our life is nothing but vanity. And stripped of God's love motivating us, everything we do is futile. I hope this morning that we will not weep and howl for the miseries that will come upon us, that the ears of the Lord Almighty will hear from us that we have lived for him. Let's bow together and be dismissed with a prayer of commitment. Oh, Lord, I thank you this morning that we have been able to celebrate your faithfulness, to even think that we have to find more places to park 
that we have to plan for our seating is just an abundant overflow of your blessing. Thank you for blessing the hearing of your word in this place. Thank you for blessing the, the privilege of giving out your word in this place for all the legion of faithful teachers and behind the scenes serving and ministering saints. But Lord, you said that our lives can get corroded if we pile up too much stuff around us. I pray that there would be an unpiling, that we might have a life unencumbered, willing to serve at your beck and call anywhere, anytime, no matter what. Don't let us rust and corrode. Let us serve you to the end and be received into everlasting habitations, hearing your well done, good and faithful servants. We pray in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen.